I'm Claire Bishop, and I'm a sophomore, and this is my fourth year of robotics. My name is Caleb Steffler, and I'm a graduate of Greenfield Central, but I've been in robotics for six years. So today we're going to talk about designing a robot, the very first step of the design process. So what we like to do when we very first see the, um, the game, we really like to talk about it in depth with the team, kind of analyze it, go over the important scoring rules, whatnot. Um, but we also really do like to look at previous games and compare the strategies. So for example, for this year, uh, Change Up, we looked at previous games such as Tower Takeover or Gateway, where they had a similar scoring or um, game objects. Another thing we really do like to do is stock social media. We like to um, look at what other teams are coming up with and developing. Um, some really good ways to do this are through Instagram or YouTube or Discord. So going with the social media aspect, one of the many parts that we often do as designers slash builders is we look at what other teams have done and then we try to improve on those methods. So for example, if someone has a flywheel that has a one to six ratio, maybe it's too slow for us. So then we can bump up the speed to whatever we need, like a one to eight or whatever it may be. Also in the design process, we like to do a lot of sketches and inventor work. And so a sketch example would be just a basic drive base like this. So you have your basic drive base, so your wheels would go in here, your motors maybe here, or whatever. And it's just getting the concept of your drive base, not really a final sketch yet, whereas a final sketch would be more solid, straight lines, stuff like that. A vendor involves both of these aspects to make a really solid and unique form of the bot. So you can take different parts and like components, and then you can put them all into one piece and then make a subsystem and see how it works, see what spacing you may need for when you go to actually build them. That way you can also look at size and so on. As Caleb said, Inventor is a great way to 3D model and CAD your robot before actually physically starting the build of it. However, this can be time consuming, so like he said, it's also just as easy to draw it out and discuss it with the team. Um, the majority of the time we spend building our robots, it's more spent on designing and prototyping versus actually building your robot. So it's very important that you have a plan and a strategy before you start building. So in conclusion, always go back and look at other game strategies and what other teams have done for those game strategies. Such as if it's a shooting game, maybe go back to Nothing But Net, which also is a shooting game. And then also look on social media as time goes on and see what other teams have been doing throughout the time. And then also try to sketch out any rough stuff like here. And then sketch out final stuff that's more symmetrical and solid and then do a better work to see how the spacing would work out. Hi, my name is Avery Fry, and this is my third year doing robotics, and I am a driver programmer. Hi, my name is Owen Bishop. This is my fifth year doing robotics, and I'm a builder. And today we're going to be talking about drive bases. So the first thing we want to go over is the direct drive. This is when you simply attach the wheel directly to the motor without using any gears or sprockets. And this, um, this design, its main advantage is the fact that you don't have gears or sprockets to add friction to your drivetrain. You just have the direct drive. Um, but the disadvantage is that you, cannot, um, you can't get more um, strength or speed out of a gear ratio because you're just directly connecting it to the motor. So this is just kind of an example of a direct drive. You see you've got the motor and the axle here will go directly into the motor so there's no need for any extra components in here. So it can be more compact and it's uh, more consistent because there's less stuff in here. However, sometimes mounting this motor to this wheel can be inconvenient for uh, size purposes. Okay, so now we're going to talk about gear ratios before we get into chain and gear drives just so you kind of know what's going on in these drives. So a uh, gear ratio is the output over input which can be calculated uh, mostly in VEX by using teeth. So if you have, you know, a 12 tooth output gear and a 36 uh, tooth input gear, 
this would simplify down to a gear ratio of one third, which is actually speeding up by three times. It can be confusing with it being a, a fraction like that, but it is speeding up uh, three times. And so what this would look like on a robot would be, you would have your motor, and your motor would be hooked up to an axle, right, that has a, what would it be? It would be the 36 tooth gear on the motor. And the, there would be a separate axle with a 12 tooth gear on it. And that would be where your wheel is. And your wheel would be going, th this axle would be spinning three times faster than that one. So that's what the whole purpose of these gear ratios and the same thing applies to sprockets and chain is to either speed up your drive or slow it down to get more torque out of it. So as we move into chain and gear drives, keep that in mind because that's the whole purpose of it is to change either torque or speed. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and talk about chain drives. So these drives utilize sprockets and chain to make them go. So the big difference with um, chain versus gears is that um, you can use less of them over longer distances. So uh, with chain, you can have one sprocket going to another sprocket and then connected by chain. So that way you can cover a really long distance without using a bunch of gears. Whereas with gears, you just have to have gear, 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 gear. And then you may, you may not be able to fit the ratio that you want to use within your drive. So with sprockets, um, they can come in handy with uh, uh, covering long distances. The main disadvantage with this is that they tend to have a lot of slack if the chain doesn't fit correctly. Um, there are ways to kind of get around this, but ultimately um, if slack is your big thing, then you might want to choose gears over sprockets. And then once about once again, going back to gear ratios, it does apply the same for sprockets as it was for gear and be output over input. So if we went back to our 36 and 12, if this is a 36 tooth sprocket and a 12, so it would be going three times faster. Lastly here, we'd have geared drives, which basically accomplish the same thing as sprockets, but take up more space due to having to use gears to get there rather than chain. So you'd have a motor with one gear on it and it would have to connect to you know, another gear. And then finally, the gear you wanna to connect to lastly. So here, this does not matter in your uh, gear ratios. It only matters the, the last one and the first one. So don't get confused with this one. So if we have, we're going back to 36 and 12. If this one is 36 deep and that one is 12, then we get back to the uh, 12 over 36. So it basically does the same thing as uh, sprockets and chains, but it takes up more space sometimes. However, you can take out some of that slack in the um, drive, which you would have with sprockets. And so you can be a little more consistent as far as programming goes. So uh, that is the advantage of a, a gear drive over a, a chain drive. So it's just personal preference. In conclusion, there are three main types of drives that you can use. You can use a direct drive, you can use a chain, or you can use gears. And all three of these have different advantages. Um, it's really, it really comes down to what kind of drive you're building and what works best for your robot. Hi, my name is Christian Voigt. I'm a senior at uh, Greenfield Central and I've been doing robotics for four years. Hello, my name is Luke Muckerhide, and I'm also a senior, and I've also been involved for four years. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about lifts. Um, there are many different types of lifts in uh, VEX Robotics. Some of the main ones are mono bars, four bars, six bars, uh, double reverse four bars, uh, cascade lifts, and chain bars. The first one of those lifts, which is undeniably the simplest one, is a mono bar. A mono bar is just a lift which has a single bar which can raise up and down. <clears throat> and it is the simplest because you only have one point that rotates right here. 
So you can just either directly drive it with a motor or drive it with a gear. The disadvantages to a simple mono bar are that as it moves up and down, it goes out. So the attachment point doesn't stay vertically aligned. And then um, it also can only get so high since it takes up a decent amount of space in your robot and it's just limited in that way. But it's incredibly simple to build, to build and easy to maintain. And so the second, a uh, little bit more complicated lift um, that's pretty popular is a four bar. And so <clears throat> what a four bar, what a four bar does is so you have your drive base here and your tower and you have two parallel bars um, that move <clears throat> at the same angle. And so what this allows is to have whatever is mounted on the end of the bar to be uh, perpendicular to the bar surface. So <clears throat> it'll stay straight even if you raise it and lower it. Um, some advantages are that it's pretty simple. <clears throat> um, and like I just said, it keeps it level. But some of the main disadvantages are that <clears throat> it can't go up very high. So depending on the spacing of your parallel bars, um, the higher you go, the, the closer they get. And so at some point they'll touch and you can't go any higher than that. And yeah. The next bar we can show you is the six bar, which is a four bar like this, but it is extended. Uh, like that. So it obviously wouldn't be quite this wide, but you have um, one long bar in the middle and then two shorter ones and they all stay parallel with each other. And it basically just allows you to get higher than a, a regular four bar, but it does still have a circular arc of where it can go so it doesn't stay vertically aligned. And it also comes with about twice as many points of rotation so it's more complex. <clears throat> so the next one is a double reverse four bar and so that would look something like this where it will be reversed and you have another set of bars with gears connecting both of them and so what this allows <laughs> is as this bar goes up it simultaneously rotates this bar up and it allows you to get almost twice the height and uh, like the other four bar designs, um, it can keep the whatever's mounted on the very end perpendicular. So you don't have to worry about <clears throat> it tipping up and down as it goes up. And another major advantage is that it has a linear motion, so you don't get that curvature. So if you're trying to lift an object up a tower, you can um, really easily uh, lift it up straight up <clears throat> and also these bars are pretty fast um, some of the other designs are relatively slow because of all the complex movements um, but yeah this is a very popular design the next type of lift which is significantly more complex but much more compact is a cascade or uh, just vertical or linear lift <clears throat> Uh, it is composed of several sections that are uh, joined by a loop of chain that goes around them. And when the chain is pulled tight or just rotated, the three sections all move upward. It, it doesn't have to be three, but however many sections there are, they move upward. And this type of lift is enormously compact. It can fit in just half the area of a robot while a double reverse four bar or four bar and really have to frame it on both sides. And it's also reasonably fast, but it's very complex to make and hard to maintain. Yeah, and uh, this type of lift is also used in industry. So a lot of the forklifts or cranes that you see has a type of cascade lift because of how compact it is and how useful it is for um, making things go up linearly. The final type of lift is a chain bar, which is similar to the mono bar in that there is only a single bar. 
but <clears throat> unlike the mono bar, uh, which only has a mounting point that changes angle, so it would be down there or like that, so it isn't uh, always parallel, or it's parallel with the bar but not with the any surface. Uh, the chain bar will um, have two mounting points with a chain, uh, which this one is fixed to the tower orientation, and then this one is fixed to the orientation of your platform, whatever you're holding on it. And when it moves up, the mounting point will always be in the same orientation, and you can even use it to go all the way around in a complete circle if you want to pick up a game object in front of your robot and then set it down behind it you have that ability yeah so there's also a final type of lift it's a scissor lift and so what this allows is um it's not very common because it's so complex and heavy but it by far allows you to get the most height out of um, a robot <clears throat> and so it's composed of a bunch of X's on some slides. And so you have a motor and it compresses one of the X's, which then compresses another set and it just keeps getting higher. And like I said, this is a very um, good lift if you're trying to get maximum height out of your robot, but it's enormously heavy because of the amount of C-channel that you need. And um, there's a lot of moving parts and um, it's, it has quite a bit of friction, so it might not be the best option. But yeah, you can see these in industry as well because of how pop compact they are and how well they are at lifting very high. Yeah, um, it's hard to do in VEX because it requires that both the top and the bottom be able to slide together as the scissor moves up, which is a somewhat complex motion. There's a lot of friction involved with the current VEX components. These were the seven, I guess, bar, uh, bars and types of lifts that we talked about. They all have their advantages and disadvantages, but uh, generally the trade-off is the more complex and hard to maintain the lift you make, the uh, better it will perform for competitions. Hi, I'm Grayson Bishop and this is my third year as a builder at Greenfield Central and I'm a senior. Hi, my name is Silas Fry. This is my first year of robotics at Greenfield, and I'm a notebooker. Today's video is over object manipulation, and there's two main types of object manipulators, which are claws and rollers. So first, most claws will be powered by one motor that's um, powering gears, and the gears will turn the claws, and it'll pinch like your fingers, and it'll uh, it can only hold one single uh, cube or ball whatever game object you're looking for. Um, most of the time, they're very inefficient. Um, you can only do uh, certain things, and they're overall pretty slow. Yeah, and then there's rollers, which rollers out of any object manipulator are the most common, mainly because there's two different varieties that can be used in a multitude of ways. Like you have your rollers, which are attached to sprockets and flaps, which basically just rotate in a constant circle and you usually put those either side by side and flat, vertical, or at an angle, which if you saw last year's game Tower Takeover, most teams used uh, diagonal rollers to intake multiple cubes. And then you have banded rollers, which are still pretty common, which those mainly rely on multiple bands interacting with the same item at the same time. That way you can have overall grip on the game object. And those are usually either vertical or horizontal. So there are two other types of scoring mechanisms, which is a puncher and a flywheel. And a flywheel is a wheel with a hood over it that's geared for speed over torque. And the hood keeps an object going up into it in a constant path and it allows it to exit freely. A puncher is a slip gear on a linear gear that, so when the linear gear is pulled back by a motor, the slip gear will allow it to move forward and the rubber bands will allow it to go faster and it'll punch a game object um, out of the robot and into uh, whatever way of scoring that the game includes. As a uh, 
Dang it, restart. A puncher is. Just went over this. I'm just, sorry. Hi, my name is Owen Bishop, and I no, I have no idea what to say. <laughs> 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 <laughs>